Hello, welcome to this session of the Center for the Economics of the Internet here at the Hudson Institute. My name is Harold Furch Scott Roth, and I'll be your host today. Uh, please continue with uh, your lunch if you like. Uh, and uh, just a housekeeping matter, our next session will be March 16th. Rosalind Layden from the American Enterprise Institute will be joining us then. But today, we are extraordinarily honored to have with us Commissioner Michael O'Reilly from the Federal Communications Commission. Uh, I do want to note that two of his staff, Brooke Erickson, Amy Bender, are here with us in the front row. Uh, and after the talk today, I'm sure you're welcome to speak to the commissioner and his staff. We'll be here for a few minutes afterwards. Uh, commissioner O'Reilly needs no introduction. I have known personally Commissioner O'Reilly uh, for a long time. Uh, we were probably in kindergarten together. But, uh, <laughs> uh, we uh, were uh, young staff members working on the Telecommunications Act of 1996 uh, for Tom Bliley, chairman of the House Commerce Committee. And um, uh, Commissioner O'Reilly uh, was uh, working on it with me, and he was always uh, a source of uh, asking the question of, well, well, what's the right answer? What's the right policy for this? And so uh, it's very fitting, uh, here we are, uh, more than two decades later, sitting together here in Washington, and Commissioner O'Reilly is going to tell us about a conservative perspective on communications policy, something that he has personally been thinking about for all these many years, and I cannot tell you how eager I am to hear, hear your talk. So please, Thank you. Commissioner O'Reilly. Thank you so very much for that kind introduction. It does bring me back to those those days uh, on Capitol Hill. We were fewer gray hairs and without kids, at least in my case. Uh, so I, I, it does bring back very good memories and also some bad memories too. There are a lot, a lot of late nights, a lot of late nights. So, but thank you so much for for being here. It's an absolute honor to return to the Hudson Institute, the site of my first speech as a commissioner just over four years ago, and which my good friend Dr. Harold Furchcott Roth helps lead so ably. The Hudson Institute provides an intellectual voice on so many communication policy issues of our day. Sadly, a function that is rarely bypassed by the instant chatter of social media congratulations and critiques by the anonymous and often unknowing. Quite honestly, after the last few months, it's a real pleasure to speak before an audience that's willing to listen, comprehend the content, and debate points of disagreement, if any, in a thoughtful and respectful way. Not surprisingly, it has been hard to discern any strategy from those who have disagreed with recent commission actions. On one hand, those individuals have begged for support for their particular positions. On the other hand, these same people willingly said and continued to say the vilest things about my colleagues and me. Well, distracting, as I've repeatedly stated, my obligation has been and continues to be to follow the statute and the substantive comments submitted in the record of a proceeding. In any event, today I would like to discuss how my approach to select communication policies is informed by certain conservative principles with a fair hint of libertarianism. Some may argue that conservatism and libertarianism are contradictory perspectives, but I disagree. Former President Ronald Reagan probably said it best. If you analyze it, I believe the very heart and soul of conservatism is libertarianism, said President Reagan. From my perspective, the two concepts are not in conflict, but follow a similar pattern to the love-hate relationship between brothers of close age. From my own childhood, I recall the days when my brother and I stood arm in arm in support of this or that. On the other days, I schemed as best I could to knock his block off. In reality, anyone can call themselves a conservative. There is no secret handshake or written test to prove your bona fides. But the true conservative reaches outcomes by respecting and heeding to well-developed sound principles. Conservative beliefs are not based on personal whims or feelings or polls, but rather are anchored in defensible core, time-tested positions. 
It's what makes a conservative somewhat boring compared to the liberal, independent, or populist. On any given issue, one can predict without haste what the conservative position is likely to be. In my first visit to Hudson, I declared preserving and advancing economic freedom to be my primary goal and the paramount lens by which I would examine issues at the commission. That speech has served me so well as it encapsulated much of my thinking about issues that would arise and the difficult policy calls I would need to make. Fast forward four years and economic freedom has generated some subcomponents worthy of discussion, thereby allowing a more fulsome examination of certain policy matters. So with your indulgence, I'd like to explore some of these this afternoon. Number one, promotion of a small government. Arguably, the application of complete libertarianism leads one towards anarchy. I don't support the absence of government, but like Reagan, instead seek a small one that is lean and capable, but doesn't try to protect people from themselves. Unfortunately, constraining the size and scope of the FCC is a constant struggle. As consumer markets evolve to include competition from technologies far outside the boundaries of our authority, the Commission's budget and staff levels haven't adjusted downward proportionally to reflect the need for reduced regulation. Number two, focus on core mission. For, on an almost daily basis, someone calls on the Commission to do something it wasn't meant to do, pay for something it doesn't have the money for, or intervene when a provider feels uncomfortable with the effects of the competitive marketplace. But the Commission is rarely able to timely do the things that it must do, or the things that it really wants to do. In fact, we have historically missed statutory deadlines with no better justification than we are busy elsewhere. And number three, funding comes from consumers. As I have stated on numerous occasions, whether it's funding for the agency or mandates imposed by it, the ultimate costs are paid by consumers. While some may wish otherwise, such costs are always passed on in one form or another to hardworking Americans who have little voice in our proceedings as they are too busy with their other life responsibilities. To explore these subcomponents and apply them as best I can to two policy matters, I've long advocated the Commission here we go, a renewed focus on sound cost-benefit analysis throughout the agency's decision-making process and USF contribution reform. If done right, both can lead to a smaller government, a focus on our core mission, and most of all, they serve as reminders that funding ultimately comes from consumers. When I last presented before this organization, I spoke at length about the notice obligations of the Administrative Procedure Act. Those requirements ensure that the process followed by the Commission allows the public the opportunity to comment on our proceedings, a very important concept indeed. At the same time, the law also requires that the Commission ensure that any decision it makes are reasoned and justified. Quite honestly, that cannot occur if the Commission doesn't know or understand the economic costs or benefits of its decisions. And we cannot adhere to the conservative principle of minimizing costs to consumers if we continue to rely on the Commission's past approach to cost-benefit analysis, which ranges somewhere between shoddy and incomplete. That's why I'm so pleased that the Commission adopted an item at our January meeting to establish an Office of Economics and Analytics. Getting the right staff into a new conducive organizational structure gets you partway to home, but more is required. Specifically, we needed to make sure that this new office received the same stature and importance in our deliberative process as similar entities at the Federal Trade Commission or the Environmental Protection Agency. To accomplish this, I worked with Chairman Pai to adopt several additional requirements that I believe will ensure that OEA is successful from the outset and fully ingrained into our agency procedures, guaranteeing it lasts, out, outlasts the current commission and remains effective for years to come. First, we added a new requirement for rigorous, economically grounded cost-benefit analysis for any rulemaking deemed to have an annual effect on the economy of more than $100 million. Just how do we define rigorous? Thankfully, you already have an existing model to follow that governs the rest of the federal government's cost-benefit analysis. It's something innocuously referred to as the OMB Circular A-4, 
which standardizes the way benefits and costs are measured and reported across executive agencies. However, due to resources this may involve, I was convinced that it may be more prudent to get the OEA established and operational before taking this next step. Accordingly, we are going to move to adopt OMB Circular A4 through, the new proceed, through a new proceeding within the next two years. In the meantime, we must improve the way we conduct cost-benefit analysis in the agency. For an example, this arises in the public safety context. What I find so unacceptable is when the commission or any agency uses the so-called value of a statistical life to justify any costs simply by assuming that X lives will be saved, typically whatever magic number is needed to outweigh the costs. If this calculation is based on fact and there's actual proof or a high probability that the stated benefits, i.e. a saved life, will actually accrue from the burdens we impose, then fine. Too often, however, it's been, the like, it's been like the 1970 movie The Jerk, in which the Steve Martin character, in a way only he could do, implores everyone to stay away from the oil cans as if they, and not him, were the target of the lunatic shooting up the local gas station. No Steve Martin fans out there. <laughs> Going forward, expect to see OEA prepare a framework in which any proposed rules must be shown to have a statistically significant likelihood of correlation or causation to any suggested benefit. Second, we need to make sure that OEA's work is not ignored by the commission or commissions to come. To do this, we adopted a requirement that OEA would be given the same prominence as the Office of General Counsel. From now on, each commission rulemaking will need OEA sign-off prior to being released to the public. In the end, the new office will play a major role on the front end in the original drafting of cost-benefit analysis and be completely engaged on the back end by signing off on each item. I believe that this heightened level of participation will help ensure that OEA gets quickly ingrained into the Commission's procedures and that future chairmen, less interested in economic analysis, will be unable to turn a blind eye to the real burdens that many of our rules impose. This should be a proud moment and a victory no matter where your political leanings take you. Switching topics. I'd like to take this opportunity to dive a little bit deeper into the subject I've thought a great deal about, especially now that I serve as the chair of the Federal State Joint Board on Universal Service. Back in 2014, I issued a blog highlighting the upward trend in the contribution factor, that is, the percentage of interstate, international, and user telecommunication revenues that carriers contribute to support the Federal Universal Service Fund an amount they generally pass on to consumers in the form of fees on their phone bills. Since that time, USF spending has continued to increase, with traditional telecommunication revenues have declined, causing the factor to reach as high as 19.5%. With that upward trend, there is a heightened push in some quarters to revise the methodology for assessing contributions. The most vocal proponents have urged the Commission to expand the contribution base by requiring broadband companies and ultimately their consumers to pay new fees to support USF. That is at the heart of a proposal by state representatives to the Joint Board. They and others argue that current law requires telecommunication carriers to contribute to USF, but also gives the FCC, gives the, gives the FCC of the opportunity to impose against any other provider of interstate telecommunications and require that they contribute as well. Well, the other provided provider language was intended to preserve the ability of the agency to assess private telecommunication providers who bypass the public switch telephone network. Many have interpreted this permissive authority to extend to broadband and have urged the commission to levy fees on broadband providers. But even if the commission could do this, and I'm not granting that point, it is equally important to ask whether it should do this. I have long opposed the idea of enacting fees on broadband for several reasons. Fundamentally, taxing broadband deters its adoption and use. Both the Commission and certain consumer groups have recognized this in the past. Moreover, having worked on the internet tax moratorium for a number of years, now enshrined in the permanent Internet Tax Freedom Act, I know there's near unanimous agreement in Congress that state or local taxes on internet access 
would directly deter the ability of consumers to obtain and utilize the internet. Federal taxes or fees would have the same effect. While the economy has been improving by some measurements, there are still families and small businesses trying to regain their footing, and I'm worried about imposing additional burdens on them. Some have suggested that this should not be a concern because the Commission has a program to help low-income consumers obtain broadband. That argument misses the mark. As I've said, one of my primary concerns is for low, lower-income people, working-class Americans who do not qualify for lifeline discounts. For these consumers, having to pay extra monthly fees could make a difference in whether they purchase or retain service. It is also wrong to assume that assessing broadband will cause the current contribution factor to drop dramatically, resulting in lower fees for consumers. I find such arguments to be disingenuous at best. Broadening the base may reduce the fees on currently assessed services, but new fees will be applied to more parts of the same consumer's bills. In other words, it would just spread the pain in the hopes that people will not notice or care enough to object. Moreover, the notion that broadening the base would result in a lower contribution factor assumes that spending remains constant, which brings me to my next point. Many advocates in support of broadening the base intended to be used as a backdoor means to increase the USF budget. Specifically, some hope that by spreading fees over a broader set of consumers and services, the Commission could actually bring in more revenue to pay a higher program budgets. That is not an unrealistic scenario, albeit it is quite dark. Back in 2000, USF spending was just over $4 billion, and the contribution factor was 5.7% mere pennies on the phone bills. However, when the FCC discovered that adding a few pennies now and then did not set off alarm bells, spending took off. Now the commission has authorized spending of approximately $11 billion for universal service. That's $4.5 billion for high cost, $3.94 billion plus annual inflation for E-rate, $2.25 billion or more for a lifeline, and $400 million for the rural health care. The Commission is currently considering additional increases for high cost and rural health care, and E-rate commenters have requested additional dollars to further expand that program, which, by the way, was doubled under the last Commission. Additionally, as program budgets are increasingly tied to inflation, some additional growth will happen automatically. Therefore, it is not surprising that it may be tempting for some to try to rejigger the base so that the assessment on each segment drops somewhat but it's still at a level to generate more funding than before. I have also heard that the contribution base needs to be broadened as a matter of fairness. That is, if USF dollars are spent to support broadband, then broadband providers should have to contribute. As a program built on redistribution, there will always be net payers and net recipients, so that argument only carries so much weight. But unfortunately, this argument seems to be more about ratcheting up burdens on competitors. In fact, I've heard proposals to install, to install new fees on edge providers. As I've said in other contexts, if burdens are too high in one segment of the industry, then we should look for ways to reduce those burdens, rather than imposing them on others. Be, to be sure, there are some reasons to be concerned about arbitrage or gamesmanship within the current contribution system, but taking the broad step of expanding the base is not necessary or appropriate for fixing discrete problems with how uncertain with how certain providers classify their revenues. Instead of broadening the base, I want to get overall spending under control. I would start by making a real effort to find efficiencies and savings within and across all USF programs. <laughs> That analysis should be done before even broaching the idea of taking more dollars from consumers. With the total budget at record levels, it is time to consider how much we are willing to take from overtaxed and fee-extracted Americans. If the total budget cannot be increased further, and I don't think it should be, we may be required to make some hard choices about the relative size of each program. During prior reforms, budget increases were considered in a vacuum. That was intentional. It can be hard to argue against funding for schools, for example, especially when incremental increases are compared to things like cups of coffee or cans of soda, while intentionally ignoring the total cost to ratepayers. 
as some of us know all too well, paying for one cup of coffee or one soda can is one thing. Paying for soda every day, or in my case, multiple sodas, can put a dent in one's monthly expenses. Going forward, the commission should set the top line budget and then ensure that spending increases are paired with offsets other elsewhere. Finally, before leaving this topic, I want to make clear that states have no authority to impose contribution requirements on broadband services. Since 2015, the FCC has specifically preempted states from imposing state USF contributions on broadband. Additionally, at my urging, the FCC declared that broadband is an interstate information service. In my view, there is no severable intrastate component for states to assess. Therefore, any state that proceeds down the path is, is acting in a manner that is inconsistent with our rules and is subject to possible preemption orders or other challenges. Instead, states that wish to fund broadband are free to do so through separate programs using their own general revenues. That is an option that several states have already exercised in establishing their own broadband grant programs. So there you have a few of my viewpoints on a couple key policy matters before the commission. In doing so, I hope I have provided some context for what encompasses economic freedom to help explain my views toward the creation of a new Office of Economics and Analytics and USF contribution reform. Like any conservative, I am open to being challenged and convinced otherwise via sound, logical arguments and defensible facts. So I thank you so much for your attention, and I stand ready to answer any questions that you may have. Thank you, sir. Well, Commissioner, thank you for that uh, wonderful discussion of conservative perspective on communications policy. Uh, I'm going to take the uh, moderator's prerogative of asking the first few questions. Absolutely. Open it up to the floor for questions. Um, in, in your talk, you mentioned about uh, the Internet Tax Moratorium and Internet Tax Freedom Act. Could you tell us a bit about that, about your experience with it, what the sentiment on sure. Capitol Hill was? So I spent three, four rounds of the Internet Tax Moratorium. Each one got a little bit longer. Uh, and the, the prevailing theory amongst you know, mem many members of Congress, the majority of members of Congress, almost unanimous agreement, was that taxing internet led by state, allowing taxing by state or local governments would depress adoption rates. And it actually was shown to be true in a number of different states that had already gone down this route. So the Congress made the decision to prevent that from occurring and, and went a couple different routes. Uh, and, and, and that would prove to be very effective and very helpful uh, for the adoption rates that we have today. And you see how popular uh, internet is. The theory being simply that increasing its cost has an impact on adoption. It's very simple. Uh, and we were able to move, and the, during my time, the longest extension is seven years since, we've, since I departed. Uh, they've been able to enact a permanent uh, Internet Tax Freedom Act, which I guess you know, suggests that I should have left earlier. But in any case, we had, you know, it's been a success uh, in terms of you know, making sure that state and local governments did not impose their new fees and taxes on Internet access. And can you tell us about the uh, scope of the current uh, Internet Tax Freedom Act? Uh, would, would it apply to FCC actions, or is it only on state and local governments? So it's, it's generally on state and local governments on internet access. It does have a carve out for USF, uh, USF uh, contributions, uh, depending on this, the structure. And that's what I try to get at in my, in my talk today. It also gets at the, the issue of duplicative uh, and, 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 and repetitive um, fees imposed by state and local governments in terms of those that apply in the offline world also applying into to, uh, into the, to the online world. So it's making sure that those universes are relatively equal as best they can possibly be done. So yeah, overall, it's been a tremendous success, um, but it's something I've had to step away from in, the, in my current role, but while maintaining the, the, the principles as we apply them to USF contribution reform. Commissioner, you, you told us, uh, I think, a great deal about what future contribution structures should not be. Uh, can you tell us what 
maybe they should look like. Uh, is there any thought about moving away from the current base to say numbers or connections or what are the what are the menu of options that the commission is considering? Absolutely, and you, you, you outlined two of them that have been contemplated for the last 15 so years. They certainly were talked about when, when you were at the, at the commission, and they still are relevant today. There's been a longstanding discussion of, okay, so it's not going to be uh, taxing broadband. What is it? And, and numbers have been a, a popular, connections has been a mechanism to consider how would you, you know, address the fact that, that the current revenue-based structure uh, is eroding before our eyes. And I acknowledge that. I admit that there is a problem. Uh, I'm just un unwilling to go to imposing the fee to, uh, to broadband. So then all, all those other discussions, whether it be connections or numbers or a hybrid of them or different, some other new uh, mechanism that people may come up with, I'm willing to have that conversation. But we really haven't had a fruitful, thoughtful conversation because everyone is rushing to let's impose that fee uh, onto broadband providers. It is, they, they, certainly the states have settled uh, in that, that front uh, in, in the majority of their thinking, and that's just incredibly problematic from my view, and how do you find some other solution? There's been this conversation that numbers are disappearing, but if you look upon what's happening, uh, numbers are slowly disappearing. It's not, a, and it's not an immediate trend, and it'll buy us quite a number of years. So that's something I'm really looking at, you know, but trying to figure out if there's, there's a way to find enough support for it uh, it's been something that's been, like I said, been talked about for 15 years, and we haven't gotten anywhere yet. And you, you pointed out that uh, USF has grown from $4 billion to $11 billion in the past 18 years. Um, and we're probably headed for another couple if you, on, on top of that. Because at every single program has reached its, is, is at its max. Um, and, and, you know, well, except for high, except for, excuse me, for, except for Lifeline, but it's only a matter of time before that does as well under the new cap. Uh, so we're, we're going to be, we're going to see more money um, extracted from consumers going forward. Commissioner, you spend a lot of time on Capitol Hill. Is there any appetite on Capitol Hill to uh, uh, revisit uh, the USF uh, program and statutory authority of the well, I think, there, to, I think there's great this. interest in components of universal service and examining parts of them. Uh, and there's also great appetite for addressing a telecom rewrite. So those pieces, in my opinion, get you to the conversation on how do we address contributions, how do you address spending. I worked on, this, on, on different efforts on the rewrite over the year, uh, over the years in my time in Capitol Hill. And, that was something that we definitely talked about, is what caps could you impose? Amendments are always put forward, uh, but the efforts always died before we kind of got to that thoughtful discussion. So caps have been contemplated at least uh, two rounds uh, in my day, uh, and, and certainly I, I imagine that being part of the conversation going forward if Congress takes up a rewrite. So if the FCC were to change the contribution structure, I assume that would be through uh, a new rulemaking, and, and that would invoke uh, the new Office of Economics and Analytics and perhaps a cost-benefit analysis of that. Uh, tell us what, do you, what you think might be one of the first rules that's going to come through this new office. Well, I, would, I should say, and, and if we were to head down some type of contribution reform, um, unless we can figure out you know, some mechanism that's not related to broadband, I can promise you it's not going to happen on my watch. Uh, so we may be stuck in the current uh, mechanism until we can find some agreement. I'm not interested in bringing forward a broadband tax uh, on consumers. It's not happening on my watch. And I don't think the current chairman is interested in doing so. And so it may be, we may be with this current revenue-based uh, eroding situation for, for a while until people come to their senses, in my opinion. But your point is well taken. It, it would likely come in the form of you know, the, a functioning joint board uh, that provided a recommendation to the commission. Uh, the commission would then have an opportunity to put that uh, recommendation out for, uh, for a comment and, and put it out for an NPRM, and we would process it as we would a, a regular item. What, I, what the heart of your question gets to, and the second part gets to, is how is this new office going to function, and what, you know, what is it going to do? And what I'm counting on it doing, especially since the work I did in the last six weeks and the good staff work that we were able to do, I'm counting on having an incredible role um, in, in providing you know, the, the, the factual data points for us to make sound decisions, which don't exist today. 
um, you know, it's, it's often the cost-benefit analysis is often uh, poorly structured, as I referenced in my speech. It is, is merely, you know, a, just an accounting equation. How many people in, do we have to determine may die for purposes of passing this particular item over here? And if it, it turns out to be, you know, $9.7 million times uh, X number of people to be able to get to whatever number you need to get over here. And it could be six people, it could be seven people, but it always seems to be just enough people to pass the number over here. And so that is a complete sham, in my opinion. It's something that I expect that this new office will be able to address in a more thoughtful way. We were able to bring forward new items in December that actually, in, excuse me, in, in January, that actually had exposed some of this and brought forward more uh, quantitative analysis. Uh, and that's what I'm counting on this new office uh, going forward. Will this new office be involved in, say, review of broadcast ownership rules of the commission? It, it will absolutely have a uh, function, depending on, on the scope of it. It's quite possible that would trigger the $100 million threshold, uh, and so therefore need to be done. But we're still trying to figure out, we, in all honesty, we have to get the, op the office up and operational. Uh, we we've have, as it stands today, we have our economists are scattered throughout the different bureaus, and we're trying to figure out how many of them can be con consolidated. The chairman set up a structure. Well, the new office will have four different divisions, uh, bringing some folks from wireline and wireless into the team. They had vision somewhere it could be, and that's something conversations will have to be occurred. Uh, will have to occur with the with the unions about you know give or take a hundred people. Uh, so that it's quite a number that'll be able to do thoughtful work in this space. And so I, I envision it having you know. All big ticket items will eventually have to go through cost benefit analysis on the front end and on the back end to make sure that the office has signed off on it and it can't just be ignored uh, going forward. And I want that work to be public. I want their good work that's, you know, that, to be able to be reviewed. And so when some future chairman just ignores it and throws it aside, that that material is available to then be able to take uh, into legal proceedings and say, here's what the commission's numbers say. Here's what the work that they did. Here's what the data points say. And here's the political outcome that they did over here. There's a couple of proceedings that happened in the last commission, I think, would have uh, duly been uh, ch challenged under that structure. Well, I could just go on asking you questions all day, but I'm not going to monopolize the conversation. I'm going to open it up for questions. Uh, and Peter Pitch has the first yeah, question. You got a mic right behind you. Yeah. Please identify yourself, and uh, also Peter. before you start, Peter, for our online audience, which is massive, uh, if you have questions, uh, please send them to hashtag Hudson Events, and we'll try to take those questions as well. But please, Peter. Thank you, Harold, and thank you for calling me first because I unfortunately have to dash. But Commissioner, I salute your thoughtful, rigorous approach. To these questions uh, very welcome. I have a different sort of question for you. How did you come to your conservative libertarian views? Yeah, the, you know, I, it's interesting. Uh, you know, a conservative is born many different ways, in my opinion. Uh, some it's particular moments that, that stretch in their, their livelihood. Others, it's years and years of seeing different issues uh, and life experiences. For mine, it was the latter. I spent 20 years on Capitol Hill examining every policy issue you can imagine. At one point, I had half of the government under my portfolio at, at, a, at a level, not only the budget side, but the policy side, and not only the appropriation side, but the, the actual uh, intricacies of the, uh, of the details. So it, it, it's something that you, uh, you frame and you, you realize, you know, it, a lot of it comes from your, you know, in my case, it, it's those experiences that you've had over many years of examining what does this policy have an impact on, how does it impact you know, American consumers, and then who needs, uh, who needs the government's assistance uh, is in times of need? What are those circumstances where the government needs to intervene? What do you have? What, what is that safety net that already exists? And then who doesn't qualify that for the safety net that may be disrupted by uh, the actions that you may take? And so that's why I spend a great deal of time worrying about those hardworking Americans who go on with their daily lives uh, who aren't subject and don't qualify for many programs under the federal government, but are still have to address the costs that we impose on providers that gets passed on to their direction. So I, I really worry about those people who are right on the threshold of, 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 our, of the lines 
uh, in terms of the breakdown of, of our, our safety net that just might be right above, that might just reside just a little bit above, but every decision that we make has an impact on them. So I, I, the, that's a broad way of saying, a long-winded way of saying that your, your experiences help frame, uh, in my opinion, your viewpoints. They, they come grounded in principles as you examine these issues. From my background, I, I studied uh, political science in my undergrad, and so that, that, that all framed to me to get to me where I am today. Uh, gentleman there. Uh, John Feroli, Charter Communications. First, I want to uh, thank you for quoting Ronald Reagan on his 107th birthday. This is birthday. Um, my question has to do with um, uh, the Laffer curve and applying that to the analysis, the cost benefit analysis. Is that being used or, or simple economic uh, models? to come to a, a fair fee, tax fee base uh, model for uh, going forward? So the, the first part of your question, you know, the, the, the OEA, this new office we're going to set up is going to have to look at a, a lot of those things that it hasn't done in the past. And what mechanisms are the best way to go about? What are the, how, how much, how, rig, how rigorous they can, they can get to? Uh, and, and the models that they can build in terms of you know, detail and cost benefit analysis. So that's all going to be something that we're going to build over the next couple of years. In terms of how you get to the contribution side and what do we look at, we do analyze you know, what is the impact on consumers. And we have done run some of the numbers over the last number of years. What are the impact of this policy decision? What's the impact of who's the, who's the distributive impact or, or effect? of that uh, policy call. So we do look at those. Your point to the Laffer curve is, is, is very interesting. There's a diminishing uh, returns because you start to see, and I referenced that in, in, in my, my comments, you start to see that the decisions on arbitrage are made um, by some, because of some of the policies that we decide. People do certain things, companies make certain decisions because of uh, the policies and the costs that we impose on them. If you give them an out, they will generally take it unless it's um, you know, strictly prohibited by our rules. And then you try and figure out how do you lock that in, and you realize you're getting backwards along with, you know, you're, you're fighting yourself, and that gets you to the point of the lever curve that if you can, you can get more revenue by being less restrictive uh, and a lower rate. So that we're trying to work through those things, and it gets to the, the point I also talked about in my speech is that if we can get to a lower contribution factor, we could, you know, the, the conversation is always, well, let's broaden the base. Let's everyone just pay a little bit, a tiny little bit on everything they own. That, that sounds great in and of itself. It sounds like that's a, a, you know, an easier way. If it's only you know, a quarter of a penny on every single device you have, you think, well, that's great. But it's really not going to be a quarter of a penny, because it's going to be like one penny uh, for purposes. And that delta is going to be the increase that they impose to be able to spend more money. And that's the problem. It's not about just broadening the base. It's also about raising more money. Uh, and that's the, the problem I have. Gentleman on this side. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, Commissioner O'Reilly. My name is Todd Wiggins. My website's called dccelebs.com. I have a quick comment and a question for you. Sure. First of all, I really enjoyed the presentation. I would like to ask you, though, uh, something that you brought up earlier. Could there be a contradiction between the ideals of smaller government uh, slash uh, when you consider libertarian ideals? I think that's what you apply that to versus the requirements, the increased requirements, particularly the litigious requirements of dealing with the challenges that you have to deal with. Secondly, related directly to the controversy of net neutrality, what is the conservative versus the liberal perspective on that? What is your general perspective on that debate? And thirdly, what would be your, pers your purview as far as national security? How much of what you do has impact on national security? Okay, you, you raised a number of issues uh, in that, that, that question uh, stream. Uh, I, I'll let me answer them backwards if I can. National security, we have a role uh, in terms of making sure that the use of our uh, communications network, a nationwide communication network, is uh, secure for purposes uh, for the infrastructure that is used is not used in nefarious against our own uh, internal, uh, internal uh, mechanisms and against our own people. But our role is, is influenced from the existing executive branch. They weigh in on particular matters uh, at the commission and have a formal process for doing that today. I've tried to formalize that process even further. Um, it's something that we look at. It's called, you know, informally, it's called Team Telecom. And they weigh in and file comments 
uh, with the agency, and we take those under consideration as, this, as the law requires in things like uh, license transfers. When licenses are being transferred, we look at who's the party that may obtain the license, what are the implications for national security, and we see comment from executive agencies uh, along those lines. So uh, that, that is part of, our, part of our job. There was a conversation that's been, that, that, that was, uh, or an idea that was shared in the last couple of weeks regarding the 5G networks and nationalizing, uh, and the possibility of nationalizing the, the, the building and the deployment of those networks. And that got you know, one of the underlying themes of that process from what I could tell from just seeing the material, was a national security concern, a uh, global national security concern. It had a lot of difficulties, in my opinion, excuse me, a lot of difficulties in terms of what, where it was, it was headed, but that seemed to be one of, the th one of the underlying reasons for it. So that's one part. The, the middle part question is on net neutrality. Um, I believe in a smaller government. I believe in the points that I raised in my speech, the impact on consumers, and I think all of those uh, affirm my belief that the net neutrality rules were harmful and actually drive up costs on providers and therefore consumers. The instances that people throw, you know, highlight that were violations that should be stopped by the commission were really not in existence. And they've been, they're two decades old, um, and it's been clear the courts have even acknowledged these were, these are prospective uh, rules, uh, prophylactic rules, if you will and not meant to actually address any particular harms in the marketplace. So we're guessing, in other words, we're guessing what's, what, what, the commit, what the marketplace may do and what harms providers may or may not do. At the same time, the providers were saying, we are not going to throttle, we're not going to block, we're not going to do unfair uh, anti-competitive uh, di discrimination. Uh, and and we're you know, going to provide the consumers the best experience we possibly can based on the ability to build a network uh, and, and get a return of investment. And so. We, uh, we take that into consideration, and I, I don't agree, I didn't agree with the past rules that were enacted, and I agreed in December to repeal those rules. That doesn't mean I believe in an absence of government. It gets to some of your first point. I think there's still a value uh, in having a firm set of rules. I just don't think the right place for deciding that is at the FCC. The FCC's job is to in, in enforce decisions made by Congress to implement that direction that Congress has enacted. Here's a right place for Congress to enact a statute to address that neutrality. They may go this way, they may go that way. I don't know which way they may go on any particular sub-issue uh, that they may decide, but there, the, is the incumbent upon the Congress to provide the certainty needed to where they would like to see um, net neutrality discussion goes, that net, net neutrality discussion um, develop and, and be enacted. because. That they represent the American people. We represent you know, people who have selected us and appointed us and do the best job we can under the statute that we have. They're able to create new statute uh, on a daily basis. And so I think all those things uh, get me to the, the outcome that, that, I, that I am today. Uh, the gentleman here. Hey, Locke Kuhn, um, trainee in, in technology and in economics. I have a question in that, um, unlike the REA, Rural Electrification Administration, that passed, uh, for internet there is no natural monopoly or oligopoly uh, due to the fact that it can be, commu communications can be done by satellite or wirelessly. Um, so therefore, it doesn't make a lot of sense to put a finger on the scale uh, by any uh, federal department because it distorts the economics, distorts technology revolution. And in, for example, in, uh, and a good example is a technology company in California, Verena Wireless, has a way to work with DirecTV to provide the triple play, including internet, to rural areas and to economically uh, depressed countries uh, around the world. So you're, I appreciate your comment. I couldn't agree with you more. I don't believe it's the job of the commission to pick winners and losers in terms of technology. Um, I just uh, you know, had some disagreement with my colleagues on a particular item in terms of uh, a universal service spending program that we're going to allocate $2 billion for building out broadband in a number of places in America. And I felt that the decision, the weights that we determined who would get the money were tilted towards electric uh, co-ops. 
I thought that was unfair because you know, as long as this technology can meet the standards that you're asking, that we're, we're, we would like it to be these criteria. If it can meet those, then they should qualify. If you're skewing the criteria for purposes of picking winners and losers, then you've, you've got a problem. And I think that's what we, uh, we did. We favored uh, electric co-ops, so we're going to probably spend a, a considerable amount of money buying a, a, a very a small number of extended networks for electric co-ops. The people who receive that will have a wonderful service, more than likely they'll have fiber-based internet access, but it's gonna cover a very small number of people uh, than you could cover with technologies such as wireless or satellite and others when we have so many people that are in need. We have 14 million Americans who have no, uh, do not, do not meet, uh, do not have internet access that meets our definition today. We have Americans who don't have anything better than dial-up today and we're not going to get service to them, in my opinion, for a number of years. We have this, the commission's been delayed in trying to address these issues um, for so long. But, but it gets to the heart of the matter is what is technology and what is the role of the commission? I firmly believe in technology neutrality, even if I don't agree with net neutrality. Uh, Jennifer Warren. Jennifer Warren, hi, Commissioner. Hello. I appreciated your comments. I kind of want to follow up sure. um, on, the, on the question that was just asked, but taken in the context of legislation. There's a lot of discussion about an infrastructure bill, and there being potentially a broadband uh, component to that and incentives. Given what we've heard you say today, what would you think are incentives that need to be rolled out legislatively that the FCC doesn't already have in its purview and how do we ensure that they're technology neutral? Because I, I agree, there's a lot of platforms, space, unmanned aerial, and ground. That's right, that's right. Thank you. Uh, two things. One, uh, I believe the commission does uh, retain considerable preemptive authority. And so if there are barriers to deployment, state, local, or tribal governments, we do have authority to, to preempt them. It would always be helpful if Congress were to provide further authority and clarify those issues so we could prevent a less litigious situation going forward. I imagine most of our situations will be uh, challenged, but if the, the, the statute is even more clear, that's very beneficial, my, my opinion. I've argued additionally that if Congress were to decide to provide any new money, um, new funding for uh, out of general revenues for a broadband build out, that it consider using the USF distribution model, specifically high cost, for making sure those dollars go out in a thoughtful way. There are a number of other programs that, that, that exist today and they have been used in the past, such as under the stimulus dollars uh, in, in 2008. And there are, um, you could create a new mechanism if you so wanted to. Uh, I believe with, even with the warts that we have today, our, our mechanism is the best that, that we have seen in place. I, I have concerns regarding the NTIA's BTOP program in the past. I've had concerns about the uh, Department of Agriculture's um, uh, mechanisms that they have for distributing funding. Um, we have a, 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 we try to impose as best market principles going forward that we possibly can. We do reverse auctions for distribution of money to make sure it's as, a, as small as necessary for serving a particular area. So if there are additional dollars that Congress decides on, I hope they will really give serious consideration to using our mechanism. It doesn't give you the, um, the best bang for the buck in terms of a, a, a press release because you can't actually, you're not going to see an immediate uh, fiber build uh, that you can uh, equate directly from a, you can in some type of a grant program, but we're gonna, you're going to get a better, efficient program, and it can be able to do it on a cheaper mechanism from my perspective. So I want to be very careful. Um, you know, and, and the third point, you, you highlighted the, the technology point uh, as well to make sure that, that if it needs a correction from Congress, that'd be very helpful from my perspective in, in solving that we don't put our, our thumb on the scale, uh, making sure that you know, if satellite, for instance, can meet uh, the requirements and the standards that we set, it should be fully uh, capable of receiving the funding, in my opinion. So I don't want to favor one technology. Um, you know, electric co-ops provide a wonderful opportunity. That's great. But I don't think they should be first in line uh, and should be favored over anybody else. Commissioner, how does, how does the commission define what broadband is or is not? And uh, technology dependence on that. So we have a standard in our rules today that we examine as part of you know, the previous chairman established. It, it's based on speed today, and it also has other measurements. But speed's the prime, prime uh, predominantly uh, one that gets the most attention. It's you know it's our 25 up, our 25 down, and, and three megabits up uh, standard. And it's something that was part of 
our recent 706 report, the statutory requirement that we examine what's happening in the marketplace and is broadband being reasonably uh, and timely deployed, in being deployed in a reasonable and timely fashion. Uh, and so we just completed that process in the last, uh, released on Friday. Uh, and the marketplace you know, has been incredible uh, change in the last couple of years. We've seen great take rates, great deployment build out. It is not by any stretch of the imagination uh, a, a done job or a completed project. Uh, we have, a, you know, like I said, 14 million Americans who still need broadband at the 25-3 standard. But that means there's work for us to do, and I will continue to, to do that in the, in the months ahead. Gentleman here. Thanks. Uh, Tom Struble, R Street Institute. Uh, welcome, Commissioner. You. So you've spoken already a bit about the role of states in administering universal service programs, also access public rights of way. I'd be curious to hear more of your thoughts on sort of the federalism issues in communications policy from a conservative perspective, because conservatives tend to embrace you know, principles of federalism and states' rights. And the last time we updated the Communications Act in 1996, we left a significant role for states to regulate you know, not just public rights of way and state assets, but actually the service itself, like intrastate calling rates, video franchising, et cetera. But two decades on, we're in a very different communications environment. It's almost all IP at this point and going forward. I don't know if there will be a way for states to regulate, you know, internet, you know, communication service that doesn't put an undue burden on interstate commerce. So there's maybe, I guess, a bit of a tension there between, you know, conservative principles and the modern communications environment. So could you speak a bit to that? Sure. Uh, and I, I gave a speech particularly on this point to to state state regulators, and and, and they didn't appreciate it as much. Uh, but, uh, but I'll suggest to you, I, I do believe in federalism, and I do believe it, it applies in many circumstances. As it, as it pertains to the internet, I don't agree with federalism. I don't believe you can break down the internet based on artificial um, you know, political boundaries that were decided, you know, in some cases, hundreds of years ago. The, the, the communication doesn't stop. If it ever did, it, never, it doesn't stop these days um, the, you know, at the boundary of one particular state or one uh, locality, or globally. It doesn't stop at one particular nation. So I have a difficulty with, with the idea that, that states are going to be involved uh, in any type of regulation of the internet. I, I, the world does change, and, and communications regulation has to change as well. Change as well, and that means there may be less of a role for state regulators. And you see a number of states get out of regulating telecommunications or communications policy, and they wind up spending more time on energy or other things that maybe others would declare more natural monopolies than than, than certainly in the communication space. So, so I. I I believe you can be a feder, you know, support federalist principles and realize that they don't apply in certain circumstances, like in the internet situation, in my opinion. Right. And I think, all right, we'll have two more questions. All right. The lady here and then the gentleman there. Uh, Mary Budars, um, follow up to that question is, you know, why do you think the federal government should have regulations when it is an international issue, you know? Right. So if, if we're talking about the internet, for instance, uh, yes. So there, you know, if there are going to be, uh, I think there should be very few regulations on the internet. So I, I don't support uh, extensive internet, you know, regulatory regime. Um, and I also don't favor, uh, you know, a structure that internationally would, would have, you know, function type, you know, structure that we've been proposed in by multiple folks in terms of, you know, some type of UN internet regulatory structure. You know, the beauty of the internet, if there, you know, there's multiple layers, but one absolute beauty, beauty of what has happened in the United States over the last 20 years that relates to internet policy is that it was generally left alone from the government. We didn't impose taxes on it. We didn't allow state and local governments to push and pull on taxation. We didn't you know, impose Title II regulations. We kept it out of it, and it flourished amazingly. And I think that's where you're, see, you're seeing some tensions internationally when someone, you know, a rogue regime tries to uh, pull the internet, you know, yank the plug for, for, you know, trying to be also technical on that point. But they try to close internet communications in a particular country, and they realize that they're unable to uh, for a certain time period. They, they may do it for, for a couple of weeks. They may be able to succeed, but long term they can't. Uh, that was the beauty of how, it's, how the technology works. So I, I actually believe in a, a less regulatory structure, and, in, and accordingly, that allows me 
to go back as a conservative and then reduce regulations on every other legacy provider that's out there. So if video is being offered over the internet, which it is fully being done today, then I want to reduce the burdens on other video providers. If communications is being, you know, voice is being offered on the internet, which it is today in terms of VoIP, then I want to reduce the burdens and think it's absolutely necessary to reduce the burdens on our existing legacy tel telephone networks. And so I think that you, your point's well taken that you know, it, it can't be done at the state level. There should be a minimalist role at the federal level. And I certainly want to be cautious about any international uh, regulatory body that has its tentacles into, this, uh, the, into the beauty of the internet. Last question. Sam McGowan from uh, Beacon Policy Advisors. Can you touch on uh, the need for spectrum auctions and the difficulties posed by Treasury being unable to hold uh, spectrum deposits? A very good question. It's uh, both short-term and long-term problems that we face. We have a particular statutory problem in terms of the short-term deposits holding issue that I think we can address. And I've been working with uh, my former friends, uh, my current friends, but former colleagues on Capitol Hill to address this issue. And I think that's something we, we, we can move uh, legislation to, and we'll be able to move legislation to fix that particular issue. The larger question then becomes, how soon can we do auctions? How soon can we do spectrum auctions, which are critical? Because we have a number of spectrum bands that we have identified for the future of wireless communications, whether they be in the mid band or high band. We've done a great work in terms of low band as a, you know, as a, as a broadcast incentive auction, but as mid band and high band are the plays right now. We have a number of bands we've identified in the, in the high bands, the millimeter wave uh, frequencies, that are kind of waiting for additional auctions. There's people who do, there are companies that have licenses, and there are others that would like to seek licenses that are available. And we're kind of stuck waiting for the timing of when that auction can occur because we need to fix this first statutory provision. In the mid bands, there's, you know, I've been working on the CBRS band, the 355 to 37, and working at the 37 to 42, and I've been working at 31 to 355, all three different bands. Um, I'm working really hard to try and free up and I'll, you know, at least allocate a portion for commercial new services, whether it be mobile or fixed, whether it be 5G or whatever the case may be. Um, but I want to make those available as soon as possible. We kind of had this roadblock right now in terms of the statutory problem, but I think that's something we can overcome uh, with enough, uh, enough uh, work and hard work behind it. With that, please join me in thanking Commissioner O'Reilly. Thank you. 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 Thank you.